Hello and welcome to another episode of the International Monetary Fund podcast. I'm Bruce Edwards. Today we hear the work of a podcast from another organization. Hello everyone and welcome back to a brand new season of Equals, which is really exciting. I'm Max and today I'm joined by my co-host Nadia. Hi guys, uh, for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome to our podcast. The Equals podcast was created by Oxfam International and focuses on inequality, a topic that the IMF is also working hard to better understand. Every single pandemic that we have experienced over the last years from uh, SARS to H1N1 to Zika, they all led to increase in inequality that was sustained years after the pandemic was over. Max Lawson and Nadia Dar's recent interview with IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva delves into her own views on inequality and the role of the IMF in stabilizing economies amid the pandemic but you also get a glimpse into her own experiences growing up in the Eastern Bloc. I remember very vividly getting up at four o'clock in the morning, queuing to buy milk for my daughter. I remember vividly my mother losing her lifelong savings to hyperinflation. You can listen to the full episode of the Equals podcast on Apple Podcasts or on many of the same apps you use to listen to these IMF podcasts. But for now, here's Max and Nadia's interview with Kristalina Georgieva. Managing Director, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us. Uh, Or if I may call you Kristalina, it's such a pleasure to have you. Nadia, of course, uh, you can call me Kristalina. I actually prefer that. And thank you very much for inviting me to join you for this conversation. Kristalina, as we were doing the background research for this interview, probably one of the most interesting and fun facts that we that we discovered is that you studied at the Karl Marx Higher Institute in Sofia, Bulgaria. And now you're the head of the IMF. I'm, I'm just imagining Karl Marx rolling in his grave <laughs> I, I wonder if you can just give us an idea of the kinds of, you know, economic ideas that you grew up with and studied um, and tell us, you know, do any of those ideas still resonate with you today? What I uh, grew up with uh, was um, a centrally planned economy that artificially pushed us into scarcity of almost anything I can think of. And uh, the uh, country disrespecting uh, any rational allocation based on demand and markets, ended up uh, going uh, bankrupt in uh, the early 90s. Uh, And I remember very vividly getting up at four o'clock in the morning, queuing to buy milk for my daughter. I remember vividly my mother losing her lifelong savings to hyperinflation. I also, of course, uh, had the, uh, uh, the luxury of studying uh, political economy. I was very concentrated on the history of economic thoughts and political economy of capitalism. And that came very handy and is very handy in my current job because while I learned firsthand the high cost of bad policies and that we need to have uh, signals from markets on how to allocate resources. I also learned that uh, markets are not perfect, Mm. that uh, they need to be uh, corrected. If markets are left on their own, and uh, we know that from from many, many studies, uh, uh, they might actually create a harm on uh, people. One very clear example of that is uh, pollution. If we are not regulating uh, what companies uh, would do, they have no incentive to protect the health of people by reducing pollution coming from their, from their uh, production. And I also must stress that we, in these uh, days uh, I grew up in, uh, have seen how a competition between a socialist system and a capitalist system in Europe has influenced positively Uh, uh, Western Europe to embrace uh, social programs and uh, investment in education and uh, health. So very useful life experience for the job I have today. That's really fascinating, Christina. It's something I've always suspected, but obviously didn't have 
first-hand experience of growing up in the UK, but I, I was always my impression that the, the, the threat of a different model, particularly on education and health and the kind of universal health coverage that we saw uh, mm-hmm. in the Eastern Bloc did make a difference. So you really think it influenced Western leaders to be more progressive than they would have been? Uh, I'm I'm uh, certain that uh, uh, it did uh, uh, press uh, Western leaders uh, to be more mindful of social issues and uh, having uh, uh, seen the uh, uh, direction to travel in uh, Europe vis-a-vis other parts of the world, this proximity of the Eastern Bloc uh, uh, did play a positive role. So while in Eastern Europe, we would queue for everything you can think of. I mean, in my in my youth, I see a queue, I line up. Doesn't matter what they sell. Uh, we played a positive role uh, by by creating also this alternative of free education, free free healthcare, uh, that led to some conclusions on the side of the uh, Western Europe that even today we see them uh, in this crisis uh, playing a positive role. The health system of, uh, for example, Germany has done really well in protecting the German people uh, from the COVID crisis. One of the things we've seen, though, I suppose the flip side of what you're saying is with the decline of uh, communism and the end of the, the Eastern Bloc, there's kind of, there isn't that same pressure on Western economies. So we have seen you know, what we thought would never happen, uh, inequality starting to go up again in, in Western Europe, in the OECD, and a kind of uh, relaxation of taxation of the richest. Do you think that's in part because that that competition is no longer there? Well, the um, counterfactual is always very difficult to define. What I, I would say is that we should be concerned about the direction of uh, inequality We have seen over the last decade, prior to COVID, that inequality in many countries has gone up. So while inequality inequality between countries has been reduced, in other words, uh, developing countries uh, have been catching up somewhat, inequality within countries has been going up. Why is this bad? It is bad because when we have parts of the population falling behind, especially in terms of education, in terms of the uh, social strength, then that translates into loss of uh, productivity. And it is bad not only for the people that are affected by inequality, it is bad for society as a whole. Absolutely. And and I think, you know, some of the, the work that the IMF has done, I mean, it's really been a leading voice uh, in raising attention to the crisis of inequality. But most recently, fascinating to see this connection between pandemics and inequality. And I wonder how concerned are you about a serious rise in inequality that, that could happen in the period to come? I am very concerned because IMF research shows very clearly that every single pandemic that we have experienced over the last years from uh, SARS to H1N1 to Zika, they all led to increase in inequality that was sustained years after the pandemic was uh, over. And we are risking to see the same on a much larger scale because of COVID-19. And actually, early data already ring the alarm bell in that regard. Hmm. We also have a very unique situation with this crisis with regard to education. We are seeing massively children dropping out of school and girls less likely to return in the future. We are also seeing kids that do not have access to the internet basically losing a long uh, time uh, that translates into loss of their ability to be productive uh, in in the future. 
I'm also worried about uh, the impact the crisis has on gender inequality. Already women are paying a higher price. They are more likely to be in contact dependent sectors, so they are more uh, affected by job losses and by the pandemic. They are seeing more need to increase their contribution through unpaid labor, and it was much higher than men to begin with, like two hours more a day. And gender-based violence is uh, is, uh, going up. Uh, So we have to not just talk about it, we have to take very clear actions in policies to counter that risk that we will come on the other side of this uh, pandemic with uh, more poverty, more inequality, and loss of the gains we have achieved with hard work over the last uh, decades. What kind of role can we see the IMS play in shaping recovery policies in a positive way? And and actually, you know, just thinking about historically, there have been huge protests from people who are alarmed by the the types of austerity measures that the IMF has promoted in, in in the aftermath of previous crises. And I think there's a genuine concern at the moment that we might see the same thing. Uh, and, and would love to hear your take on that and how you can actually help countries spend what they need to spend and, and make those who need to pay for that, the wealthy and corporations, pay their fair share. First, the IMF has a very important role as the institution that holds its hand on the pulse of the economy through our Article 4 consultations to be well informed about the risks and the opportunities to address these risks, to do the analysis that would give policymakers sound foundation for what they do. Uh, Secondly, the IMF is uh, financing countries in this emergency and in the packages of uh, financing we provide, we establish what is good practice and how they can use the money most effectively. And I can tell you, I take pride. We turned on a dime in this crisis. We have extended already financial lifelines to to 75 countries. And we are asking only for two things. One, please use the money for your doctors, your nurses, your clinics, and for the most vulnerable people and parts of your economy. Two, keep the receipts. We want to know how the money was used. And in this focus on the most vulnerable, we are very clear to to show what can be done to put a floor for social spending, to target uh, uh, money effectively. Uh, And I I can tell you something that I was so pleased to to see when I I, uh, took uh, over that um, uh, now in, in, uh, in our engagement in countries in in uh, 90% of the IMF programs with low-income countries, we do include social uh, uh, spending floors. Very, very important. Mm -hmm. And three, uh, I'm sure you have heard people joking that IMF stands for it is mostly fiscal. (laughs) In that spirit, we have to have fiscal policies, taxation and expenditures, based on 21st century direction of the economy, structure of the economy, we have to recognize that uh, uh, governments are pouring huge amounts of money to support uh, businesses. Well, these businesses have a responsibility to help in the recovery, to make it fair. And uh, we have to look at at, at what can be done in terms of uh, Uh, reforms in taxation. The fund has been clear. We think that there is space for more progressive taxation that is not going to uh, impact uh, growth. There is a lot of space to eliminate loopholes. There is a lot that can be done to make sure that the uh, structure of taxation reflects how the economy has evolved. We know that the digital economy is the big winner of this crisis. Well, we have to see how that helps long term to make the right investments uh, in uh, human capital. Chris, can I 
Can I just going back a second? I, I mean, that was music to my ears on progressive taxation, um, and and just to be really specific, I mean, would you be very pleased if you saw a big uptick in the number of countries worldwide implementing greater taxation of wealth? and high incomes in the years to come so that we don't see the return to austerity or the kind of release of the rich that we saw after the financial crisis? It is important to recognize that above all today, we what we worry about, we worry about two things. We worry about a durable end of the health crisis everywhere, and we worry about jobs. And so we have to be uh, very thoughtful around how we make sure that firms retain their workers and those that cannot survive uh, or those that are benefiting from transformation driven by this crisis can hire workers. And when we think about taxation, it has to be done uh, with this clear objective uh, in mind that we want the economy to return to growth, and we want this growth to be job-rich. Warren Buffett has been saying now for quite some time, there has to be a recognition that uh, we are not in a good place in terms of how we source revenues to make the necessary public expenditures. And at the time, now is a a moment of of crisis uh, when uh, there is a much higher acceptance of change. And so let's make that change. I think that there is an opportunity and we we hope that the IMF will really take that uh, leadership there. It makes total sense to aim on the other side to have a better economy that is also a fairer economy than what we came uh, out from. That would take thoughtful rethinking of uh, fiscal fiscal matters. We would do our part objectively researching and demonstrating what can be uh, a possible way uh, forward. Countries have to make clearly a bigger investment in people, especially in skills and education. And they have to make a bigger investment in accelerating a transition to low carbon resilient economy. Investment in education is actually investment in resilience. If people are skilled, they are more agile and they can adapt to change much better. Uh, I think you're absolutely right, Kristalina. I, I think one of the big problems that countries like Kenya are facing now is this huge and increasing debt crisis, which you've spoken mm. eloquently about. And one of the ideas on the table, I have a long memory, uh, I think put forward by Anne Kruger was some kind of debt workout mechanism so that creditors take more of a hit. Do you see that coming back some way of kind of having a bankruptcy court for nations? Because it seems to me that creditors are getting off very lightly once again with this new debt crisis. Well, the, uh, first, let's, uh, let me stress that both the IMF and the World Bank were very fast to advocate successfully for the uh, debt service suspension initiative for poor countries. You were very quick, uh, but you're paying for yours, but the, the World Bank refuses to pay for theirs, I think. We have been uh, fortunate to have an instrument in our hands and uh, to bring immediately our shareholders, our membership on supporting ratcheting up this instrument so we, we, we can we can do more for yes, our definitely. members. Yeah. Uh, but uh, uh, that doesn't uh, resolve uh, something that we know is there and it is uh, we do have a problem with um, private sector participation in this uh, standstill and more broadly we have a problem with a very different structure of debt today than it was 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. At this moment, I don't see big appetite to go towards bankruptcy, but there is appetite to significantly improve the international architecture for debt restructuring. We are putting forward a um, paper for discussion, a concept for discussion by the G20. We are very keen to see progress in this area of more coherent, more likely to succeed debt restructuring. There will be, there have been countries, as you know, uh, Ecuador and Argentina are recent examples. 
where there has been success achieved in that restructuring, it is very likely there would be more countries to come because the level of debt uh, has gone up even before this crisis and now it is it is going up, up again. And uh, to get that more principled approach with improvements in terms of uh, collective action clauses that are applied in a thoughtful way would go would help tremendously if uh, we see appetite among uh, uh, the membership to reopen discussion on bankruptcy uh, courts if you wish of course we would like uh, we would like to encourage that it was a good idea then but we also uh, are very pragmatic we need solutions fast because the problem is knocking on on the door on a positive note what we have seen in this crisis and we don't talk enough about it is incredibly synchronized response by central banks and by finance authorities and by the IMF and the World Bank to put the floor and then to address the issue of debt in the, for the most vulnerable uh, countries very quickly. And I want to sustain that momentum of working together, making sure that, that we, we have solutions that come fast enough to be meaningful. Kristalina, I um, it's so interesting to hear, you know, from your perspective where things are going and what's needed. Um, and thinking about another area that needs, you know, multilateral and global action, uh, debt is one of them, but climate is another. Um, and you've spoken many times about the need for a green recovery. I saw, you know, as soon as you came on board as the managing director of the fund, that was an area that was clearly um, important to you. So I, I want to ask you, you know, I, we're approaching the end of the interview, but I, I, I can't lose the chance to ask. Hypothetically, if we were to take a middle income coal dependent country, you know, what can the IMF do concretely to make sure it's supporting that country to transition to a decarbonized economy? So what, what the IMF is already doing, and we will be doing more of it, one for countries that are uh, either uh, highly vulnerable to climate change or play a big role in terms of uh, uh, the necessary mitigation efforts, we are already doing quite a lot of analysis and we are bringing some of it in our Article 4 consultations. We have done a number of climate impact assessments for highly vulnerable countries. We are using this to bring countries to a point of designing effective mitigation and adaptation uh, strategies. Secondly, as we move forward in uh, countries with programs, what we are discussing with them is this broader notion of resilient economies. And no more resilience can be narrowly defined as what is happening in the financial sector. Hmm. And the financial sector itself is not free of climate risks. Right. So if we want to see countries growing, and especially if we want to see a job-rich recovery, the uh, low-carbon climate resilient investments can play a major role. We can generate jobs in reforestation, dealing with land degradation, building insulation, renewable energy, these are all the jo jobs that we need now that some of the uh, uh, job-rich uh, uh, sectors like uh, tourism are, are shrinking. It's mostly fiscal, and we are working with, uh, with countries uh, to recognize the, um, at the time when they need to raise more revenues that uh, carbon price and the most effective way to do it is through carbon tax are instruments they can use. Yeah, I think we would support that. I think it's not just it's mostly fiscal, it's mostly fairness. I think that's the key issue for us. Agreed. Um, Agreed. So hearing you today and listening to your reflections, Kristalina, if I mean, you've joined, you've taken this job at, at the time of the biggest economic crisis in a century. You know, the history books are going to be written about these few months. How would you like you to be remembered and the IMF's action at this crucial time when the history books are written? We acted swiftly and uh, we targeted the most vulnerable, most vulnerable people, most vulnerable countries. 
we have stepped up in a way that has no historic precedent at the IMF. But above all, I want the history to say people in the IMF poured their hearts, worked relentlessly so they can be relief from this once-in-a-lifetime crisis. Well, Kristalina, we are we are seeing that, uh, and and we are so grateful for 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 you taking the time to be with us today. Great pleasure. Yes, that was fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Max. Thank you, Nadia. That was IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva being interviewed on the Equals Podcast, a podcast about inequality created by Oxfam International. You can listen to the full episode on Spotify or Apple or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to check out other IMF podcasts while you're there. Subscribe if you like what you're hearing and follow us on Twitter at IMF underscore podcast. Thanks for listening.